All right, friends. Hello and welcome to your Armor Up Your Immune System. This is class one of three, and I am very excited to be with you today, especially as we get into this transition to fall right now. And knowing that this is a great time of year to really dive into what you can do to keep your immune system as strong as possible for you and your family. Now, what we're going to talk about today is this uh, class is really designed if you fall in one of two categories. Number one, you might be yourself, your family, whether you're an adult or watching this for your kiddo, someone who struggles a lot with your immune system and you feel like all winter long you're coughing and you're sneezing, you're spending your PTO because you're watching your kid at home and it gets kind of tiring and frustrating and you want it to be happy and joyful. Or you might be someone, we have a lot of families who are actually doing pretty well and they say, you know what, I just want to make sure that I am doing all we can this season because we want to just really stay on top of things, especially, you know, we're going into winter number two of COVID. So if there's still concerns around that um, or you're noticing in your kiddo's school, there's still people being out and you just want to protect your family as best as possible, even though you do pretty well, this class series is going to be super applicable for you, too. Uh, for those of you, if you don't know me, my name is Dr. Tai. I own Whole Family Chiropractic, and something that I am really passionate about is the brain and the nervous system and how that impacts the immune system. So we work in our office really on an overall health and wellness basis, helping people get as healthy as possible and stay as healthy as possible. And uh, what I'll be sharing with you guys during this series of classes is not only things that I've learned through seminars over the years, and uh, I really enjoyed teaching with my practice members, but also things that we apply in our own household and our own family. Uh, my son Mason is 15 months currently, so uh, we're definitely in the phases of building up his immune system and making sure his body is growing as strong as possible. So I'll share things that we've applied with him as well. Um, so the three-part series, let's do this. We'll do an overview of today. The goal for each class is to be done in half an hour. And I'll be reminding myself along the way that we've got two more classes after this. So we've got plenty of time to cover everything that we need to cover. Um, one thing for you, if you're watching this live, feel free to post a comment. If you have a question, um, if you just are enjoying the talk and you want to give a thumbs up, um, that's appreciated as well. And uh, if you're watching this as a recording, feel free to post questions as well, and I can always uh, do a follow-up response to answer those. So today's class, why some people get sick and others don't, is part one, we're gonna focus on what are some of the deeper layers that influence how our immune system stays strong and healthy. Number two, we're gonna talk about next time is if you do get sick, what can you do to not only get over it more quickly, but also set your body up to be even stronger coming out of that so you don't get caught in the cycle of getting sick, having it last for a long time, like just starting to recover and then you get sick again. And uh, I know over the years we've dealt with enough families who have that like recurring cycle all winter long and it's really exhausting and frustrating. Um, and then class number three, we're going to talk about why it, do we get sick more often in the winter and what can you do to boost yourself in the winter months? So for today then, what we're gonna focus on is what is your immune system? If we're all exposed to the same bugs all the time, why aren't we always getting sick? I'm gonna talk about, well, I know we have bugs in our body. I've heard of things like probiotics. So if those are bugs, but we're supposed to avoid bugs, what's the difference between the two? And then how do we support those good bugs in our body? <clears throat> and it's actually pretty amazing that 80% of our immune system is those probiotics that we find in our gut. And we're going to talk about not only why that is, but the different types of them and what you can do to support yourself there. So part of today's class is to give you some peace of mind that you to keep your immune system strong. The goal isn't just to be walking around avoiding germs at all costs. And that's a big thing that I've seen, especially with COVID now, that um, we've gotten like almost too afraid to go outside or too afraid to do anything. And I want to give you some empowerment around that. 
and it's still good obviously to wash your hands and you know maintain you know like cover yourself when you sneeze things like that but that's not the only factor to keep your immune system strong and actually you know if all you do is avoid bugs we're going to talk about what happens then does that actually weaken your immune system so the goal with today is to empower you, get you understanding more about your own immune system, your child's immune system. So not only do you feel more resilient going out, but also empowered to make decisions around your health care and your family's health care. So with jumping in here, what is your immune system? In the past, when I've talked about immune system, sometimes I get to the end of the talk and someone's like, oh, yeah, by the way, I like what you shared about how we can support our immune system. But could you tell me what it is? So that's what we're going to just cover briefly here. Well, the immune system job is a couple things. One is to recognize, is that part of me or not? This, an example here is if you have an autoimmune issue or if you've heard of those things, sometimes the body is recognizing itself and the immune system is attacking itself. That's what um, recognizing self versus non-self is. Number two, your body has to recognize, hey, is this thing harmful or not? If pollen's floating through the air and I breathe it in, I really shouldn't react to it, right? Versus if I swallow something like food that has food poisoning in, I should react to it. I should throw it back up. So recognizing if something's harmful or not. The immune system also does a lot to detox and get rid of waste, things the body doesn't need. And it even reacts in the case of an injury. So if you get a cut, if you get a bruise, if you see some inflammation, it's an immune response is helping your body heal from an injury, just like it would help your body heal if different bugs are um, entered into your system. There's three main lines of defense, and we're going to go through these briefly, um, but it helps give you a context not only for today's talk, but over the next couple talks as well. So the first line of defense I like to think of as a castle, where the goal is just to keep things out from getting inside. What this means is if your castle has a really wide moat and high walls, it helps protect invaders from getting in. So a lot of times a bug, we get exposed to a bug, maybe through our eyes, we breathe it in through our nose, we swallow it. And it goes into like that initial contact with our body. So the first line of defense is to say, say right at that entry point, let's kick it out and get it out right away. Maybe something hits your eyes and you start watering and crying to help get some fluid moving it out. Maybe you breathe something in you shouldn't have breathed in, achoo, and you sneeze 120 miles an hour, boom, pushes out the other way. Part of this that we're gonna talk a lot about today is the microbiome, which means all those little bacteria, the probiotics, as I mentioned, the gut bacteria, the good bacteria that we have, what are they doing in this first line of defense? And it's pretty amazing what they do. Um, we'll share some of that in a moment. So that first line is right away, try to kick it out. The second line says, okay, I see you're there. Let's just do, let's just dump everything at you. This is like a non-specific response where we're just trying to stop you right away. And then the third line makes me think back to in spring break in high school, my friends and I went to Medieval Times down in Dallas, Texas. We were the Green Knight. And basically at Medieval Times, if you've ever been there, there's the big ring with all the, the audience members cheering for their own night. And basically we learn like, all right, we cheer for the green night and anyone else we cheer against. So what the third line is, is now it's like getting specific. Is it the green night? Is it the red night? Is it the blue night? And what this line of defense starts to realize is it recognizes if you're getting the same invader. That's why if you get sick with chicken pox as a kid, you're able to defend against it the rest of your life. If you get sick with something like the flu or COVID, ideally your immune system should be able to learn from that. And even if the virus is mutating, you're still gonna set yourself up to respond better in the future. So this is where something like antibodies are created. In the case of our castle analogy here, it'd be like if you see the red army invading, and you notice every time the Red Army is invading, they only go for the drawbridge. They don't worry about trying to climb the walls on the side. They only go towards the drawbridge. So the next time the Red Army invades, your defense system can say, hey guys, don't worry about guarding the walls. They're not going to attack that anyway. Put all your energy toward the drawbridge and you're going to have a much easier time fighting things off. 
All right, so as those of our lines of defense, let's go over then the idea of it's only exposure to bugs that make us sick. I wanna share a story of a woman that saw me years ago. She was in her mid twenties and she worked at a daycare. And obviously at a daycare, she was around a lot of bugs. Now she was worried because every winter she would get lots of colds and multiple rounds of strep throat. So much so that the doctor said, hey, if you keep getting strep throat, we're gonna to have to pull your tonsils out. She said, Dr. Ty, I don't have time to get my tonsils out and try to recover from that. Let's see what we can do. So we started adjusting her. And after working with her for a bit, she goes from fall all the way through winter and she gives me a high five come March. She goes, Dr. Ty, guess what? I had like one cold this year, no strep throat. And the one cold I did have, boom, I kicked it quickly. So she was pretty excited. Now, the key with this, one is if you have a chiropractor, make sure you're seeing them during these winter months if you do want to help strengthen your immune system. That's something we've seen with families we work with over and over and over again is more resiliency. They just say like, hey, we don't get sick as often. Number two, the real emphasis with this point is that the bugs didn't change. So the winter that she didn't get sick, it wasn't because she started, and this was years ago, but she didn't start like wearing a mask to daycare or washing her hands 10 times more than she was before. All her routines were the same. The same amount of kids, the same amount of slobbering and spitting everything that kids do, the germs are still flying everywhere. The only factor that changed was that her body was stronger internally. And that's a super, super key point is that it's not just exposure to the bugs, but it's how resilient your own body is. As a matter of fact, there is a book uh, called Quantum Healing by Dr. Deepak Chopra. And in the book, he talks about an experiment where they put a cold virus directly up people's noses into the mucous membrane. That's what we said a few slides ago was the first line of defense, right? So you're putting it right into there, trying to bypass that first line of defense. Guess how often people got sick? One out of eight people got sick. Only one out of eight. So even though the cold went directly in their nose, it was only one out of eight that got sick. So clearly here, there's more to being, uh, more than just being exposed. And obviously, as I said before, we wanna make sure we're you know, still doing the general things to wash our hands and, and stay clean. But building your body's resiliency is a super, super critical factor. And I like to think of it as fruit flies, as an analogy here. So imagine you're at home and you start to see some fruit flies buzzing around the kitchen. What's your first thought? Is your first thought, oh, I must have left the window open last night and they flew in? Probably not, right? Your first thought is, oh, those bananas have been sitting out for two weeks. Yeah, I think they went over the edge here and they got a little rotten, right? So the idea here is that fruit flies aren't um, present if your banana and your fruit isn't rotten or near the edge or overripe, right? Uh, well, maybe let me take that back. They might be present, but they're not allowed to thrive. So that's the other piece with this. Do fruit flies, and I'm just kind of posing this here, do you think like every night fruit flies are flying around the outside of all these windows, kind of like the tooth fairy and they're like peeking inside like, hey, do we have any rotten fruit in there? Nope. Okay, next house. Do we have any rotten fruit? Nope. Next house. And then if they see a rotten banana, they fly into that house and in the morning you wake up and you've got fruit flies. Or maybe those bugs are on the fruit all along and when the fruit gets a little overripe, they're allowed to flourish and start to grow. Maybe it's similar with your body. Maybe we are around these bugs all the time and that if our body's in a certain state, these bugs have the opportunity to grow. With our body, we have 30 to 40 trillion cells and that estimate's always changing, but the point is we have a lot. At the same time, within our body, we have 100 trillion bacteria. When um, several, a couple, two, three decades ago, the Human Genome Project, they looked at all the genes in our DNA. They found about 20,000 human genes 
but amazingly enough, about 120,000 genes for viruses. And that's how viruses replicate is they're actually not alive themselves. They go in our cell, incorporate to our DNA, and have our body make them for us. We even have like multiple groups of species of fungi on our body. So if our body has all these bugs, what is the point of them? Why are they with us? And what happens if we don't have them? So if we avoided bugs altogether, guess what? We wouldn't have 100 trillion bacteria living on us at any given point. And before we go into what these bacteria are doing, and that's what we're going to focus on today um, of that realm is our own microbiome and bacteria, let's go into what happens if we don't have these bugs. So for quite a while now, again, I think maybe I'd look back 20 plus years, um, maybe even longer, 30, 40 years. Anyway, scientists have done experiments with what they call germ-free mice. So they take a mouse and instead of letting it get exposed to anything in the environment, they immediately wrap it up in a nice sterile environment, kind of like the bubble boy. They put the bubble around them and never let them get exposed to any germs. Now here's the deal. What they've found when you're not being exposed to germs is not only are you maybe not exposed to the potentially harmful ones, but you're also not exposed to the ones that our body needs. As I said the slide before, all the ones were naturally um, that are part of us. So what they found is if you take a mouse and completely avoid any germs, they have weak to no immune system. The immune system and the nervous system are super closely interrelated. They have a super weak nervous system. So they're not able to fight off any bugs if they're never exposed to any bugs. The other thing that they found is that these, because of a weak immune system, so they've tested them to very specific things, they're more susceptible to bacterial infections. They're more susceptible to the flu. They're more susceptible to food allergies. In some of the upcoming classes, we'll talk about some of the balance in the immune system. There are um, two pieces, Th1, Th2, and they want to be in balance. There's certain things that can throw them out of balance, which tends to lead to more allergies and less ability to fight off uh, viruses. We'll talk about in the upcoming talks how to keep those in better balance. So not only do you experience fewer allergies, but your immune system is better able to fight off, say, viruses like the common cold or something like COVID. Um, but what they found is that in this germ-free mice, that also shifted them to be out of balance. For your immune system, how does this apply? Because obviously we're not in a germ-free environment in our world. But what they found is that germ-free mice, they're kind of tough to manage and produce and get expensive. So they said, hey, what if we just put something in the mice that wipes out most of those bacteria and most of those germs, such as a broad spectrum antibiotic. Well, what they found is that mice given these broad spectrum antibiotics had similar results as the germ-free mice. So their immune system was skewed and weakened as a result. For you to apply this to yourself or your kiddo, what that means is, as you might have known, if you had an antibiotic, make sure you're replenishing it with probiotics, and we'll talk about that here upcoming, but also knowing that there might be other options. Um, next talk, there's a doc, Dr. Larry Polevsky um, out east, who uh, in, he's a pediatrician, and we'll talk about some of his um, really cool things to support your body. Next talk, um, but on his website, he says, you know what? I write about a prescription a year for antibiotics because he's found ways to help people fight things off holistically and not rely on that recurring spiral of antibiotics. Because the thing is, back in the day, they if you went in with something, they would culture it. So for example, you think you have strep throat, they do a swab, they wipe it on the little petri dish and they grow it and they say, yep, that's strep or that's not strep. Back in the day, everything that you came in with, they would culture it, one, to see if it is bacteria, and two, what kind it is. And then they would give a very specific antibiotic to try to fight just that one off and leave the rest of your own bacteria alone. 
Well, nowadays, because of the um, sometimes the demand or the time crunch, they don't have time to go through that whole process. So you might be prescribed an antibiotic, even if they're not quite sure if it's viral or bacterial. That can be really common with ear infections, as an example, because a lot are viral. <clears throat> but then number two, because they don't even know if it is a bacteria or not, they don't know which one it is, so they just say, okay, take this broad spectrum antibiotic because it's going to be more likely, if it is a bacteria, to cover which one it is and kill it off. And it might be great to get you through that scenario, but what it also means is you're going to be wiping out a lot of the good bacteria in your body as well. So what are those good bacteria? The probiotics in our body, they're part of that first line of defense, as I mentioned, they are found where we initially expose ourselves to bugs. So if we swallow something, it's going down our esophagus into then from our stomach and then all the way through our intestinal tract. So especially in our gut, our intestinal tract has 80% actually of our immune system because of this first line of defense, but that's where the majority of these probiotics are found. So most of you have heard by now the term probiotic. It's those good bugs. It's part of that 100 trillion or Yep, 100 trillion um, bacteria that our body has. <clears throat> There's a ton in our respiratory tract because we can also breathe things in. And we want to be able to use that as the first line of defense. <clears throat> so these bacteria are pretty amazing. And I want to emphasize what they do so you have incentive to support them. They help us differentiate friendly from non-friendly germs, as we talked about before. If it's sensing something's not friendly, they can actually make their own antibiotic specific to what bug it encountered to say, yep, yeah, that one, that looks like some E. coli a little bit higher in our system than we want it to be. We can create some antibiotic to help fight it off early on. It can actually release viruses to help kill off the germs. So there again, maybe a virus isn't always a bad thing. They can release chemicals that like, it's like a slime slick which means if a bug is in your intestinal tract and it's trying to get through to get into your bloodstream, our own good bacteria can create this slime that act as a barrier. They prevent it from going through. A really cool thing is that if you are nursing or you're breastfeeding, a mom's body will pick up what's going on in the baby's body through the saliva, especially, but uh, the smell as well. Um, but the mom's body can actually pick up if there's a bad bug in baby's body. Mom's body can shift what she's producing in the milk to send baby the right things to create that, um, for baby's bacteria to create that slime slick and help defend itself. It's pretty amazing what these bugs do in a beneficial way. <clears throat> and ultimately, they can signal inside then to that second and third line of defense saying, hey guys, we got something here, something might be invading. I want you to start getting ready. These bugs can communicate with the brain. Um, if you've ever looked into autism, you can see that gut inflammation is a really common piece and that has to do with this. If something's out of balance in the gut, it can send inflammation into the brain. And um, there's people talk about like the gut being the second brain, that enteric nervous system. Um, and as a result, they can also create things that tell us to slow down. Sometimes getting sick is a way of our body to tell us to slow down. And it can um, do this through the, the vagus nerve, which is a nerve that helps put the brake pedal on. It makes vitamins, B vitamins, vitamin K, and as we talked about before, helps detox and get rid of waste. So these bacteria have a lot of really important things and stimulating digestion. So the point of that is, if you can support these, you're doing a ton for your immune system, your digestion, and your mental health. We're gonna cover here briefly then, is how do we support these good probiotics? And what I'll say here is we're gonna keep it pretty high level because it can be rather simple. So where are these bugs? Well, one way to get them naturally is fermented foods. And you've probably seen this list before but want to emphasize that here is a good way to get these bugs in a way that they're growing naturally. And what I would do 
especially some of these upcoming slides, it's going to be a list of like the different types of probiotics and what they work on. So I'd recommend if you want to uh, grab that, just do a screenshot so you can reference back to it. Um, with fermented foods, one thing just to be aware of is if they get heated up, that kills off the bugs. Um, just like a fever in our body can help like slow down bacteria growth. Or if you're out camping and you need to get some water from the river to drink, you boil it first, right? So cooking your food, I remember my grandma would often make um, like a pot roast with sauerkraut in it. And sauerkraut's good because it's got those fermented, it's fermented, so it has probiotics. But if you cook it in the oven for a bunch of hours, a lot of those start to die off and it's not as effective. So if you are going to be cooking, you can add that fermented food after cooking and it helps save those probiotics. Um, if you get pasteurized food, that also can kill things off, which um, can be good to, again, help spread germs, but also just be aware of that. So when it comes to then probiotics is there's a lot of different strains out there. And uh, I'm going to show you a chart to help apply to your specific needs here. But um, digestion, so this is when we look at and the link to the reports in the bottom of this page here, what things probiotics can help with. Digestion is a huge one. Constipation, diarrhea, IBS, colitis, um, going then into immune system. As we said, if 80% of our immune system is in our gut, clearly this can help fight bugs off, as we talked about before. Some of the things that research has shown bugs can help there. And then brain health. They've even done studies where they look at kids and if they're getting enough probiotics early in life, that it can help prevent them from getting ADHD or Asperger's. Um, it can affect, because of inflammation and the process there, it can create a lot of stress on the brain. So anxiety, um, depression, autism, everything in a brain stress realm, good bugs can help your body with. So this is a chart then that... If you wanted to screenshot it, it might be kind of small. So if you can screenshot it and blow it up, um, what it shows is different things that bugs can help with, the good bugs. And I'm going to zoom in here, and this might be a better one to screenshot if you want to save it. So across the top, excuse me, you'll see a list of different things, different probiotics have been shown to help. So let's say you're going to be traveling. And you say, I want to avoid getting traveler's diarrhea. You can look in the traveler's diarrhea column. And I'll show you here. Um, it jumps ahead. So this would, again, traveler's diarrhea. You can look and say, okay, the current evidence is effective if I get this lactobacillus GG. This other one here, it doesn't really help. So if I want to prevent traveler's diarrhea, I could look for a supplement or a food that has this specific probiotic in it, and it's going to help me out. Maybe we go to something like, say, I'm kind of dealing with anxiety. Well, this Bifidobacterium longum with lactobacillus can, has been in the research and the study shown to help with anxiety. Um, or colds and respiratory infections, or mouth and throat infections. So it's actually a really cool chart um, that I will. So here's page one with, you'll see then the type of bacteria on the side. This is lactobacillus. This is probably one that you've heard the most of. It's in a lot of the foods that we get. So you'll see it on the label in your yogurt. Um, I'd say from what I've seen anyway, like most of the research has been done in this category. That's why this one is basically some types of that lactobacillus are applied to all those categories. And then the last one here is uh, two more bacteria you'll see on the side. So the, the columns across the top are the same on all three of those pages. But if you need to reverse or rewind and screenshot those, please do. Um, ultimately, that can help you then choose what type of probiotic you want to take based on what you want to help support in the body. A lot of times, most of those that if you want to know like how much do I need today that you'll see on the label of a probiotic or on a food label it'll talk about this CFU and basically it's colony form formulizing unit formulating unit um, like how many is in a serving a lot of them recommend one to ten billion 
And one that I like is this Claire Labs, some of the functional medicine docs that I've talked to or taken seminars from tend to like recommend this one. Uh, we don't sell supplements in our office, so it doesn't really matter to me what one you do, just something that we've used in our house when my son Mason was little, especially um, as an infant, we use the infant formula of Claire Labs as an example. And here's an uh, example of one of theirs, it's called the complete. And then uh, you can see the nutrition label there. So the cool thing is, is it lists all those different ones that it has in that single formula. So you don't have to go to the back to that chart and like get a different one for each category. A lot of them like this have a whole bunch all together so you can get everything in one, one supplement. And there's the, a really cool report where it talks about uh, they've tested different probiotics to see do they have as many as they say they have. Are there any contaminants? Um, and uh, it's a good reference. That's where that chart that I just showed you came from. All right. I know we're a little bit over. We're almost done, so we'll wrap up here shortly. What good bacteria, what probiotics eat is something called prebiotic. And this is basically just like our body needs food to be nourished and survive, those good bacteria, they don't just survive on their own, they need food too. These prebiotics are what the good bacteria eat to be able to nourish and actually make some of those things like the slime slick that I talked about before. So the prebiotic foods are something you wanna make sure you're giving your body as well to nourish your good bacteria. So not only are you putting the good bacteria in, but you're giving them food to survive on. So here's a list again, no use me in me reading these to you, but screenshot it so you have for reference. Basically, foods, um, there's foods, the soluble fiber is what can be a prebiotic, but not all foods with high in fiber have prebiotics, so this list can help you go through that. All right, so one more story then, and we'll wrap it up for class one. To summarize so far then what we've talked about before I give the last story is that your immune system helps recognize if something's foreign or not and if it is foreign recognize is it harmful or not to kick it out. All bugs in general aren't bad and we want to make sure we're supporting the good bugs in our body. My grandma then in this last story is another example of the strength of your body is the most important. In 1952, there was a polio outbreak in my grandma's town. It was Monroe, Wisconsin, the south part of Wisconsin, a smaller town, and my grandma came down with polio. She was the 60th case in the city, and when she went to the doctor, the doctor said, guess what? Unfortunately, you are going to lose the function of the left side of your body, arm and leg, and we're going to have to put you in a brace. So what we'd like you to do is come back in a month and we'll fit you for your brace and kind of like get you set up on what needs to be done. Obviously, and that's when my grandma, she was in her early 20s at the time, um, and just started teaching. So it's a pretty heartbreaking story to hear like the rest of your life, you're going to have lost the function of part of your body. Fortunately, her parents knew to, um, they heard from a neighbor like, you should at least try this chiropractor in our town. So they went to the chiropractor, started getting her adjusted, and all of a sudden things start like healing. They start clearing out. She goes back to the doctor six weeks later, and the doctor says, okay, let's get your x-ray. We'll get you ready for your brace. They take an x-ray of my grandma, and the doc's looking at it thinking, hmm. He calls in two other doctors. They're all looking at this x-ray like, wait a minute, Helen. Your spine has straightened out. Like, obviously, you have the use of your limbs. We can see that, but your spine's straightened out too. You don't need a brace anymore. And not only is that a cool story, one, again, kind of emphasizing that chiropractic can help your immune system kick things out of your body, but it also emphasizes the fact that the most important piece is how strong your body is. When I looked more into polio, it is actually 95% of cases are what they call asymptomatic. So you have it and you don't even realize it. Um, there's a homeopath that I know that says, well, if you get polio, it actually helps the tight junctions of your gut seal up for to prevent things like leaky gut or prevent autoimmune things down the road. Less than 1% of polio is where you get that paralysis. And in my grandma's case, she was one that was going down the route of that less than 1% with paralysis, but she was able to reverse when she got her body stronger. 
she even said that at the time when she was teaching, there were there was a class with five kiddos in it, and one by one, they were gone for a week at a time. And the doc said, yep, they all came down with polio, but it was the mild case. So they, you know, they were out for a week and then they were back playing and kind of back to be normal kids. And that really made me think of it, wondering if polio decides to invade the town, is it like six neighboring towns with polio? One has really strong polio, one has really mild polio, and some have in between. And they all invade Monroe, Wisconsin at the same time. Do some people catch the mild form and some people catch the severe form? Or are they all maybe catching kind of about the same form, the same strain that happened to be in the town at that moment? And it's the strength of their body that makes the biggest difference. And uh, to be honest, we'll never really know for sure. But personally, that's my belief is that it wasn't like they got fortunate to catch the mild version of polio. They're fortunate because their body was strong enough from the beginning to be able to get it and kick it out. Or in my grandma's case, it's not like it switched from the mild case to the, or the strong case to the mild case when she got adjusted. No, it was the same like strain of polio that her body was dealing with. It's the strength of her body that caused it to then be mild. So then she could enjoy the rest of her life moving and playing and golfing with her grandson. So I share that story as we wrap up for class one then is to really help you understand that, like give you some encouragement that the stronger your body is, the more it can really handle. Like your body is pretty amazing and pretty resilient. It's designed to handle these bugs that are out in the world. Otherwise, we wouldn't have an immune system. It's designed to be able to take something and kick it out pretty easily. So when you strengthen your body and build its resiliency, you can do that for you and your family. So we're going to continue this discussion in class two and class three. As mentioned, next time we're going to talk about if you do get sick, what you can do to kick it out more quickly so you get that strong, quick response and set you up for success next time. If you have any questions in the meantime, reach out myself and our amazing team, myself, Dr. Chelsea, as the chiropractors in our office, we really, really love helping you guys out, keeping yourself as strong as possible for you and your family. So I'll see you guys in class two.